Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you can take seat, we're going to about to start. Thank you for coming. And I would like to call Mrs. Catherine Bethia. In your seats, you have uh, a program, an agenda. So uh, now we're going to have some words from Mrs. Catherine Bethia. Welcome and uh, opening remarks. Thank y'all for coming tonight. I'm with the Soil and Water Board for Taylor County, and we have uh, four supervisors that work on that board at the, the current time. And of course, everybody has two or three things they do. Uh, so some of them, one's at a ball game with a child tonight, and uh, there's three of us here have been able to make it. Uh, ben Lavelle is one of our supervisors. Mr. Walter Dodson is a supervisor, and, and myself. Uh, we chose to pursue this route because Taylor County has one of the longest coastlines in the counties of Florida. I don't know if you knew that or not. I did for a long time. This is conservation. It's, it's important. All of our seagrasses, all of our marshes, our scallops, our fish. And so we feel like that education is the best thing we can do. And all of us want to keep it going. All of us want to keep it where we can keep, continue to enjoy it. That's conservation. Bottom line, that's what it's all about. Whether it's conservation, trying to be conserving our deer or whatever. And we, should, we chose to start this several years ago. And uh, it, there's, there's just more and more. And we've had people come in now this year. We have the, the Sea Grant people here. And they are videoing tonight, and it's going on a live feed on their Facebook page, and the uh, address is on, uh, and it will also be on there for, if you want to look at it later, and, and here's what some of the speakers have to say tonight. Uh, we have refreshments over here, and in between, anytime you feel like you need something, or in between speakers, go over, there's water, cold water, and uh, some cookies, and nuts. The first person we're going to have tonight, and I don't know how many of you know, even if you are from Taylor County, is Christian Bronco. He is our new marine major. I'm real excited to get to know him. And he's, uh, he hit the ground running. Of course, there was a lot of work left in, in, for him to uh, take up. And he's really been doing a lot here in Taylor County, although he's, he's only been, been able to be with us a short time. And he's going to... Uh, give you some information on what's happening in Taylor County with a lot of our uh, coastal line areas. And he's going to up, update you on a lot of that, too. There's a, there are a lot of things going on, but he's behind the scenes. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Victor, and we'll just, we're going to go through this, but if you have questions and you want to ask questions <laughs> for information, this is a guideline. We're not hard and fast with it. Okay? Thank you, Victor. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Victor Blanco. I'm the new Marine Extension Agent for Taylor County. <clears throat> I've been in the position only for six months, and I'm happy to be part of this amazing community and this amazing county you have. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, programs uh, I run in Taylor County and how we are going to relate to the uh, scallop season. So uh, we're running uh, about eight different programs. Uh, I'm just going to mention them uh, shortly uh, because we are here to listen to the specialists in S-Clubs. Uh, the first one is, uh, and we're, I, I have a, a, a slide at the end uh, talking about the scalloping season monitoring where we have partnered with different organizations uh, to do some survey and some remote sensing uh, in this uh, area between Stenhatchee and Deco Beach as a, uh, as a pilot project because it's the first time we're gonna do this in Taylor County with the Taylor County staff. Uh, also, as you might know, we have the artificial reef uh, enhancement and monitoring program uh, since 1992, we have been working on uh, 
uh, different deployments, uh, uh, different artificial reef sites out here in the coast. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, later too. Also, uh, we have the recreational fisheries program where we try to go to different tournaments and uh, set a booth uh, where we show some uh, educational uh, flyers or different uh, tools to show better ways to uh, do uh, the recreational fisheries. Also, we uh, have the derelict crack traps clean up uh, in partnership with the, the Park Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the Nature Coast Biological Station. We go out in low, very low tides and we get out of the water some uh, of the derelict traps that are left out there. We have uh, estimated that at least are thousand uh, crab traps left every year in the water. So this is an issue that we have to, to address. Uh, also, we have the Telecom to Marine Mammal Standing Network. This is a new program we're uh, just starting. Uh, we made a couple of uh, uh, workshops uh, in Kitten Beach and here in Stenhatchee. We got some volunteers. They went to some training and we look forward to work, uh, to have some workforce when uh, it shows up any stranding in the area. You can report that and we are going to go and take care of, of the situation. Uh, and also we have uh, three citizen science programs. The first one is Water Watch. It's about water quality uh, sampling. Uh, we just got trained on that. We are trying to get volunteers to get involved, we train the volunteers and uh, we give them the equipment. So once a month, they do some water quality sampling and testing, and they share that information with a state uh, database, which is very important to see what's going on in our water. Uh, next, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to the water microplastic sampling uh, training uh, th this is an issue that is coming to the table uh, recently, the impact of microplastics on uh, marine environments and uh, natural resources. Uh, so uh, it is a program that we're going to start soon. And finally, we have the Horse Crab Monitoring Program. Uh, that's a FWC program and we help uh, supporting the volunteers going in the field, uh, trying to identify uh, uh, in Hagen's Cove, for example, here in Taylor County, uh, we go and we search for the horse crabs in sand, we tag them or release them, and that helps for the, to understand what's going on with their population. Uh, about the artificial reef program, uh, here are some facts. Uh, in, since 1992, there's been an investment of uh, $580,000. Uh, for uh, artificial reef and, uh, deployments and enhancements uh, with a variety of funding source, but mainly from FWC program. Uh, actually, we have two permitted sites, the uh, Stenghatchee Futures Management Area and the Boca Reef. Uh, we, uh, we also have two other uh, reefs, the Andrew Reef and the Stenghatchee Reef. They are not permitted yet. Um, but we are, in the next slide, gonna tell you a little bit about, about that. Uh, those artificial reefs are located uh, far, 17, more than 17 miles away from the coast. So not everybody is, is able to go there. Uh, we're trying to uh, improve the program to make some deployments in, in, in shallow waters so more people can uh, use this uh, important uh, ecosystems. Uh, in average, they are located about 35 feet of water. Uh, uh, in the history, it's been the 1,300, to uh, 1300 tons of material deployed. That's uh, culverts, uh, scrap, metal, scrap, and uh, tetradron fish cups, 
uh, and in the last five years, we have deployed uh, almost 500 uh, fish cubes, 120 tetradons, and 61 tons of different materials, covering an, an average in the last year only of uh, 2,500 square feet. Uh, what we're planning to do is to, uh, the artificial reef program is in hand by hand with an organization, local organization named the Taylor County Reef Research Team. Uh, the people that was involved did uh, an amazing job. They want to uh, get new people involved to uh, help the new generation also uh, improve the, the artificial reefs. Uh, so we would like to, uh, as planned, recruit new volunteers that can help in different ways. Uh, we have sent different applications for to FWC to fund uh, new deployments and new monitoring. Uh, we just got the notice that we were not selected for uh, for new deployments, but for the monitoring, which is a new uh, thing that we're going to do here uh, in. Uh, Taylor County uh, and so also we are trying to think to request to the US uh, uh, Corp of Engineers the expansion of the Bukai reef site or repermit uh, the shallow water and re and re reef or find a new site to get permit in shallow waters uh, and also for us it's going to be uh, for me it's going to be uh, a challenge to get the people aware of what the Taylor County Reef Research Team is about so people get, get uh, more interested and involved as volunteers. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're here today to talk about a scallop season and uh, we were trying to uh, put this together with different organizations and people that it's really important uh, for the scallop season. Uh, so why are we in Taylor County interested in doing some monitoring during this season? And it's because there is a big gap of information since uh, uh, the information that's being collected is for the whole Big Bang area and not uh, a specific information only for Taylor County. So we, we design a, a, a project to go out there uh, in, the, in the field and with the help of uh, someone who's going to talk to he to you here later today, uh, we're going to use some um, drones and a manned aircraft uh, things to go out in the water and take pictures and video of the boats and to see what's going on. And also, on the boat ramps, we're going to be collecting different uh, using a survey, uh, collecting different data that is going to help us understand what's going on and how it is really impacting the community for one side because we want to know what's the economic impact of the scalloping season and also what's going on with the scallop population but that's something that FWC takes, takes care of and Professor Geiger is going to talk to you about that later tonight. Uh, so for us it's really important that uh, to measure the impact uh, for example, if we measure the impact on artificial reef, we know that uh, for every uh, uh, for every dollar uh, that uh, we invest in artificial reef, we get ten dollars back. So we have a very good return on that. Uh, Residents spend over fifty-seven million dollars associated with fishing and diving in in the Big Bang area uh, counties and that helps to get new jobs uh, um, you know for local development which is a good thing uh, we want to measure that and to so to to get some proposal have to improve and get a better development of our county uh, oh, what can you do to help as local residents or, or people who live in the surrounding counties uh, I would love you to become uh, volunteers or members of the uh, Taylor County Reef Research Team. Uh, identify potential volunteers or donors in your contacts networks. Uh, donations can be in time, 
money, logistics. We don't have a boat. Sometimes I need to go out in the water and I don't have a boat. So if someone, someone can just help me go out in the water, that counts as a volunteer time and we will really appreciate that. Uh, also consider establishing a memorial reef or corporate reef. Uh, there's, this is something that might help uh, uh, fund uh, indirect or artificial reef program. And of course, continue supporting our consumer extension programs and events. Get involved with some, somehow or your sons, your relatives. They're, they're all welcome to be part of the programs depending on what they're interested in. Uh, and of course, participating in the Telefront extensions meetings to evaluate and bring ideas and outcomes. I really appreciate uh, you being here tonight. Um, I look forward to you at the end, get the good information you want from the, to have uh, the best scouting season this year. Thank you very much. Uh, now, according to the uh, program, we're going to have uh, Savannah Barry from Seagrand and Nature Coast Biological Station. She's going to talk to us about the Seagrass Safe and the Scallop um, season. Great. Thank you, Victor, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. As he said, my name is Savannah Berry, and I am based at the University of Florida IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station, which is in Cedar Key. It's a new marine station that UF is building to invest in the Big Bend region, and there's lots more information in the back, and for those of you online, you can find us on our website. And my background is in seagrass ecology, and I'm very passionate about seagrasses, and I hope that if you aren't already, that by the end of this talk, you will be too, because seagrasses are incredibly important for scallops. That's why we're here. So hopefully you can spot the scallops there hanging out in the seagrass, and I know that Dr. Geiger will touch on this in his talk, but scallops depend on seagrasses as juveniles, and they're also very closely associated with seagrasses as adults. So if you love scallops, Hopefully that means you also love seagrass. So just a little bit about basic seagrass biology. They're actually flowering plants, and the picture up there is a close-up picture of what a seagrass flower actually looks like. And a lot of people don't realize that they're more closely related to lilies than they are to the grass that's in your backyard. So seagrasses are, um, you know, they're pretty cool because they're a flowering plant. We have Five species that are common on the Gulf Coast, but the two major ones you'll see out there are turtle grass, which is the top one that's got the thicker blades, and manatee grass, which is the one on the bottom that's got the more cylindrical blades. And those are the two major habitat forming seagrasses that we have here in the nature coast. They're really Im uh, important because they have a well-developed root and rhizome system, which means that they create stable habitat that stays in place over time rather than algae and some of the other plants that don't have those, that root system that really is part of uh, what makes seagrasses function as they do, as really important habitat. Um, they require really good water quality, which basically means plenty of light. So that's why they do so well in this really shallow <coughs> coastline that we have where plenty of light reaches the bottom. And that's why protecting water quality is really important because seagrasses can't thrive in water that's murky or dark because of course they're plants, so they need light to survive. So some of the ecological functions of seagrasses, almost everyone I talk to knows, knows already that seagrass is important habitat for lots of different marine organisms. So that one pretty much goes without saying, but they do a lot of other great things for our coast, like increasing water clarity. So right now I've heard that the water out there is really clear and beautiful. And that's partially because seagrasses trap the root and rhizome system I mentioned earlier, they hold sediments down near the bottom, but they also slow down water flow and cause particles to settle out to the bottom. And that makes the waters more clear and more beautiful for us to snorkel in and find scallops. So they do that for us, which is really great. Um, they also sequester carbon. They take up a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and shuttle it down to be buried under the sediments, which is good. I personally think that they're really beautiful. They increase the beauty of our waters and um, the recreational value of areas that have seagrasses. 
they provide a lot of oxygen to the water being plants of course they're photosynthesizing they're releasing oxygen and that makes the waters much more habitable for fish and invertebrates and all the things that we love to catch and eat from our oceans and they also increase biodiversity by providing habitat there's just more species in an area that has seagrass than there would be in an area right next next to it that has just mud and sand so they uh, they really are important for that and because of that, they are one of the most valuable habitats on Earth per acre. So our seagrass here in the Big Bend, we are extremely lucky in Florida, in this area of Florida, because we have the second largest continuous seagrass meadow in the United States. The first largest one is down in the Florida Keys. So Florida is lucky because it has a lot of seagrass compared to other areas in the United States. And here in the Big Bend, that seagrass is protected by uh, this map here on the right, it might be a little hard to see, but it's the Big Bend Seagrasses Aquatic Preserve. And if you are boating in Taylor County, except for right off of the Finn Holloway River, you are within the Big Bend Seagrasses Aquatic Preserve. So Taylor County ranks second of all Florida counties in terms of seagrass acreage. So uh, about 162,000 acres of seagrass right here in Taylor County. And so, um, and the other Big Bend counties are right up there with Taylor County as far as having a lot of seagrass acreage, which is really great as an economic resource for the county. And of course, I mentioned the Aquatic Preserve, which is a way that the state has invested in protecting and monitoring the seagrasses in this area. So even though that, uh, you know, we all understand the value of seagrasses and there are many mechanisms in place to protect seagrass, there are lots of threats that seagrasses face. The number one is degraded water quality, decline in light, light penetration to the bottom and that can occur through siltation basically sediments washing into the coast from coastal development deforestation all kinds of different things can cause that um, but also nutrient enrich enrichment here in florida we hear a lot about algal blooms on the coast and that can really really affect light that reaches the bottom for seagrasses and that's probably the leading threat that seagrasses face uh, globally there are also several other different threats that they face, um, but one that I really want to talk to you guys about today is physical damage by propeller scarring and anchor drags. And the reason that I want to talk to you guys about this today is because it's really easily preventable by just taking a few steps to prevent it. Um, it's, it's one of those things that, we, that happen by accident or happen through careless habits, but it's really an important thing that we can do to reduce the many stressors that are facing seagrasses. And this is something that's within our personal power to change. So just in Taylor County, just to give you an idea about where the, the scarred areas are, as far as the 31 coastal counties in Florida, Taylor County ranks eighth in scarred seagrass. This is probably really outdated data. This was the, it's really expensive to do an assessment of propeller scarring density because it requires aerial imagery and then somebody to really look at like every square inch of that image and and map it out and so the last time this was done was 1995 which is actually before recreational scalloping got really popular along this coastline so just take these data with a grain of salt i mean back in 95 we already knew it was a problem it's probably a much bigger problem now unfortunately we don't have the hard data facts to say exactly where we rank and how many acres are scarred but as of 1995, there were over 8,000 acres of scarred seagrass in Taylor County, mainly in the areas off of Keaton Beach and Steenhatchee and the Pepperfish Keys, which are, of course, shallow nearshore areas that are really popular scalloping grounds. Um, so why is seagrass scarring a problem? Well, um, there are several different reasons. I hear people say a lot to me, well, I mean, it's grass. It grows back, right? I mean, your grass and your lawn grows back, you know, that kind of thing. But like we said, they're really not that closely related to lawn grasses. And uh, a propeller scar, best case scenario, takes about a year to heal naturally. And um, sometimes it takes many more years than that. I mean, I've seen numbers up to a decade if, if it's in an area with, that gets a lot of wave action and a lot of currents that scours out that scar can actually make it expand. Uh, so it's not really like the kind of thing that just grows back overnight, um, especially if that root and rhizome system is damaged to, with the skid. Um, it makes seagrass less resilient, so it just is an, another added pressure on them. It can make it, them more easily lost by other stressors like hurricanes or water quality declines or things like that. It's just kind of like poking holes in the fabric of, of the meadow. 
they degrade habitat quality. Um, also, it harms your boat. I mean, it harms your boating equipment. It's sucking sand into your intake. It's um, really just not great for your equipment. And they're also just unsightly. I've heard a lot, I've talked to people a lot about this issue and I hear it's ugly a lot. Uh, so what are we doing about it? We're doing, we're trying to raise awareness. You may have seen the boat ramp signs that we put here in Taylor County. We put them in Citrus County and Levy County as well. Uh, we have a big social media campaign where we're trying to get the message out by trying to make these flashy graphics. And we really hope that if you're interested in spreading this important information that you'll go on our Facebook and share out these posts as we make them. We started last week and we'll be going through the end of July. Um, just to try to, to get the word out about how they scars take longer to heal than most people think and, and other things like that. And we're just trying to spread the word too about how you can be a seagrass safe boater. So we have a website, bseagrasssafe.com. Any of you um, that are watching online can visit that website and you can take a pledge to be a seagrass safe boater. And all of you in your chairs got a green sheet that's a seagrass safe boating pledge. And we ask that you just take a few moments to read over that and sign it and just hand it in in the back there at our table. Um, it really seems like a small action that you can do, but it really is a, you know, every small step counts towards trying to protect our seagrasses. So basically, the seagrass safe boating pledge that we're talking about, we're asking people to think about and be aware of their surroundings and avoid seagrass meadows when possible. If you can take a route that won't take you over seagrasses, do that. If you do have to go over seagrass, trim up your motor and you may even want to use a trolling motor or pole, push pole to go through those shallow areas. And if you do happen to run aground on seagrass, turn off your motor, push off of the area before going under power again, instead of trying to power off. Um, so um, if none of that feel good information about how seagrass is happy and good and um, really helps out the environment, if none of that changes your mind, seagrass protection in this area is also the law. So like I said, we are in an aquatic preserve and in an aquatic preserve carries up to a $1,000 fine for damaging seagrasses. So with that, um, I really do want to wish you guys all a happy scalloping season. Remember to use your mark channels when possible. Check the tides before you're going out and um, do like these good folks here pushing their boat through shallow water as they go and search through scallops, uh, search through the seagrass for scallops. So scallop season brought to you by Healthy Seagrass. And like I said, we have got a lot of outreach materials on this information on our social media pages, which would be the, the, nature, the UF IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and also the Florida Sea Grant Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And my contact information is there. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much. I'll be here till the end if you have any additional questions or comments. All right. Um, appreciate it. And all of you, I just did. I wrote down a question that I'm going to ask Savannah later. Um, we're going to have uh, SWC law enforcement. Uh, we have a new lieutenant, and uh, I don't know how long he's been here. I just, I, I just found out he was new to us because I have to find a, who's here every year. And uh, Lieutenant Mike Guy, and I talked to him, and I think y'all are going to appreciate him. And they have so much information for us and are so important to all of us <laughs> that enjoy the coast. So, Luke, go ahead. I'll let you take that. Thank if you. you have questions, if you think that you did, by me. I'm Lieutenant Mike Guy. I'm the new patrol supervisor for Taylor County. Um, and I'm going to get into the boating safety regulations and targeting divers down and some of the, the okay yeah um, be before I get started before I get started I wanted to introduce uh, your chief deputy with the Taylor County Sheriff's Office Chuck Mansi he wanted to take just a minute of time to address their initiatives and what they're going to be targeting over the, the holiday weekends and scallop opening which begins tomorrow so if you like Chuck thanks so much 
Hello, everybody. How are you? Good. Good to see you. On behalf of Sheriff Wayne Padgett, welcome to those that live here. Welcome to those that traveled here. Welcome to Taylor County. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we anticipate another busy summer season in our coastal areas. Uh, scallop season has come to us a little early this year, but I can assure you that the Sheriff's Office is prepared for whatever may come to us on the land, and we've been working with the uh, FWC Division of Law Enforcement on emergency plans for those issues that will arise on the water. So welcome. Hope you have a good summer season here, and we look forward to serving you throughout the summer. Thank you very much. I also want to introduce Sergeant Thomas Gunner. He is in charge of our special operations. He will be here throughout the summer. You'll see him on the land and on the water. So this is Sergeant Thomas Gunner. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, while somebody's out there scalloping or anything, but when you launch your boat, some of the things that we run into is problems. Uh, people not pulling their trailers out of the way. Uh, so I'm sure anybody that lives in Hatchy has seen that. So anybody that's going boating or anything, make sure you pull your vehicle all the way in the parking spot. Make sure your trailer is not out in the open. Also, uh, put up your uh, cooler, stuff like that. Uh, fishing poles, make sure all your items are secure. But uh, y'all need anything, just call us. Okay. <laughs> You'll just have to scroll down to get to that part. Okay. And we'll, we'll go back. Um, I, I would like to also reiterate what they're suggesting with the boating, with the traffic that's going to be involved at your boat ramps. It's going to be extremely congested. So when you're going out, and especially if thunderstorms pop up, when you're coming back in, please be patient with people when they're loading and unloading vessels and boats. Uh, we we want to see as few problems as we can and make sure everybody's having a good day and having a fun day when they're on the water. Um, we're going to be targeting strictly boating safety and scallops, which is what you're all kind of here to see. We do have a lot of extra um, enforcement officers with FWC that's going to be coming in from surrounding counties um, just because of the congestion that we're going to be seeing on the water. Uh, so we have a lot of additional resources that will be on the water and try to be helpful. If you do see a violation or you do see something that we need to know about, just know that there's only a few set of eyes with us, but you, know, you can help us tremendously by making a phone call and letting us know about it. Um, if you see something, say something. Uh, the first thing, boater education requirements for all the young guys and, and even the anglers that are just getting, or even the, the boaters that are just getting into boating, um, there are some requirements. Um, anyone born on or after January 1, 1988, who operates a vessel um, powered by 10 horsepower or greater, uh, must complete an approved boater safety course. Um, NASBLA is a, a national association. Um, they, um, we recognize other states as long as those boater safety um, courses are NASBLA approved. Um, there are some exemptions, um, and I have brought in some literature and some handouts um, that if I don't get a question answered that you have while I'm here, you can feel free to see me before you leave. Um, there's some saltwater regulations over there. There's some boating safety uh, handouts and uh, a few other things that will help you with the requirements that uh, pertain to whatever particular vessel that you may have. A lot of our requirements um, are guided by what your vessel length is, and those are adopted from the Coast Guard. Um, so those are um, requirements that we're going to be looking at while we're on the water, depending on what type of vessel that you're in. And I'll try to cover the basics of what we see on a daily basis. Um, basis when we're on patrol and what you can expect out of the officers when they pull up and ask to see certain items. Equipment and lighting requirements. Um, it is the owner or operator of the vessel um, that's responsible to carry, maintain, and store that equipment. So the first thing that we're probably going to ask you is who's the captain of the vessel or who is the operator of the vessel. That is the person that is in charge of the equipment and safety equipment that's on that vessel. Um, primarily, they own the vessel. Sometimes they borrow it. Um, but make sure if you're going to be on a boat that that equipment is readily accessible to you. 
because when you're taking on water or your boat's on fire, that's not the time to be digging through compartments and looking for life jackets and, and things that you're going to need. Uh, PFDs, that's the primary thing that we look for first. Um, that is what causes deaths and that is what saves lives. Um, PFDs, don't get confused by all the types that you're seeing. That's just for visual aid. Um, the PFDs that you're going to be required to have on a vessel is one Coast Guard approved PFD that fits each person on board. And typically what we're going to do when we stop a vessel to do a safety inspection is we're going to ask to see the exact same number of life vests for the number of people that are on that boat. And what we typically do just to eliminate confusion because we're seeing pontoon boats and there's a lot of people on them, we'll ask the operator or the captain to pull those life vests out. That way we know he knows where they are and hand one to each person on that boat. Those live vests and PFDs, they have to be fitted for that person. So you can't give a 300 pound guy a youth life jacket, you know, and him only be able to get his arm through it. Um, they need to be in serviceable condition. They can't have rips or tears or something that would eliminate them from being able to provide flotation when you go in the water. Um, the inflatable life vests are very popular. That's what we wear. Um, they are made to automatically inflate when you hit the water, and some of them are manual inflation. Um, just be mindful that those, they do not count unless you are wearing them on your body. They don't replace the requirement for the top one, two, three, or five. They don't replace those requirements. So even if you do have an inflatable that you're wearing for comfort, make sure you have these for each person on board. Um, the, the inflatable, some are designed to not roll you over if you get submerged or get knocked out. Um, and so that's very important to make sure that you have what you need and have what you're comfortable with. If you're not, if you're not comfortable in the water, make sure you wear it. Uh, we encourage everybody to wear them, even though it's not a requirement uh, for adults. Um, anyone five and under needs to have a life jacket fitted for them on their body at all times, unless you are anchored or moored. So any of the kids that you have on your boat or any of the kids that you're seeing, make sure they have them on. Uh, and it's a good idea for them to leave them on at all times because with that much vessel traffic, it's going to be on the water. When someone goes in the water, um, you don't see them as well as you do a boat, you know, and they can be floating and all you see is just a little head poking out of the water. So it's a good idea. Uh, I do it with mine. They don't like it. Uh, they get mad with me, but I make them wear them. Um, the top four that you're seeing at the bottom, which is the, the seat cushion style, we've all seen those and even the life rings. Um, those are required anytime you have a vessel that's longer than 16 feet in length. That is a requirement in addition to the wearables that each person needs. And we're, we're discussing strictly recreational what we're going to be seeing starting tomorrow. The commercial and the, the larger vessels um, in those handouts that I brought, the recreational boating handouts that, that show you what the safety gear is that you need. It's all in there and feel free to ask me whenever um, I get done if, if you need some clarification on any of it. Um, the fire extinguishers, um, they are required uh, on vessels. Um, a lot of the vessels that we're going to be seeing are recreational style, 16 feet, 18 feet. Um, they're required anytime you have a fuel tank that is enclosed in a compartment where vapors can form. Um, they are re a requirement. Um, those um, fire extinguishers, they must be um, approved by the United States Coast Guard or underwriter laboratories as marine use. Um, so don't grab one out of your house that you use in the kitchen. Make sure it's for marine use um, if you're going to be using it. And make sure it's in serviceable condition um, where the needle is in the green. Um, there are some cheaper versions that are acceptable and they have a small green plug on the top. To test those, you just push that plug down and if it pops back up, you're good. Um, but most of them now, they're very inexpensive. I would recommend having one, at least one, um, on any vessel you you know you're going to be operating. Um, especially, it, there's an there's a exemption um, for these. I don't like to discuss exemptions. I like everybody to be safe when they're on the water. Um, but if you have a outboard engine and your gas tank is to where you can throw it overboard if something catches fire, you know there's exemptions on vessels less than um, 26 feet. Sound producing devices, that is what we call a horn or a whistle, that what everybody um, refers to. These are a requirement on any vessel. Um, the referee style whistles will do, um, the air horns will do, 
Um, a lot of people whistle. You know, that does not work if you're knocked out or you're in the water. Um, and I get this question regularly. I've been in this line of work for 18, almost 18 years. I get this question. I have to do a lot of the, the news where I sit on local news and discuss in the spring boating safety and fishing regulations, and then in the fall do hunting. But these sound producing devices, it never fails whenever we do uh, these talks that someone always, or when we pull up to a boat to check uh, boating safety gear, um, when we ask for sound producing devices, please do not point at your wife or girlfriend. <laughs> that, we are not gonna side with you, and we want your happy day to stay happy. So that does not count. Visual distress. Anytime you're in inlets, channels, rivers, anything where you have a shoreline further than two miles apart or on any coastal waters, you're required to have visual distress signals. Um, what that means to you is if your vessel is 16 feet in length, is less than 16 feet in length, I'm sorry, um, you will need three visual distress signals approved for nighttime use. If your vessel is greater than 16 feet, you must carry three additional visual distress that are approved for daytime. You can carry three total that are approved day and nighttime combination. And if you get in trouble, those are just the uh, approved the, the flares and flare guns is typically what we see. That's the most common. Those can be picked up at West Marine or you can get them on Amazon, um, anything like that. Those are a requirement on coastal waters. <laughs> Sir? Okay. Um, you know what? The, the question was, what is the approved disposal method for flares? Um, I, my best guess, I don't know, but my best guess would be we could contact the Coast Guard and they, there would be approved facilities to take them to. But in Taylor County, those, a hazmat facility would be good to take them to. I don't know who in Taylor County would take those as a hazmat. Fire department. Possibly the fire department, but they don't need them to start uh, training fires and things along that line. Prior to doing that, I would call them and make sure that they have the ability to take those. Sometimes policy will guide whether they can or cannot take them. But thank you. Are you allowed to have outdated flares in your boat? Um, you can have them, but you must have serviceable flares, which would be in date on your on your vessel as far as your safety requirements for those. Um, Navigation lights, um, during periods between sunset and sunrise and any reduced visibility such as fog or rain, you're required to display your navigation lights, um, which is your bow, red and green, and then your anchor light, which is a 360 all around white light. It must be the highest point on your vessel and it can be seen from 360 degrees. Um, anytime you anchor or moor, meaning you're not underway, um, you can shut down the front and just produce your white anchor light. Um, if you're going to be anchoring, such as watching the fireworks, 4th of July, um, that is going to be the, the uh, regulations for navigation lights, anytime between sunset and sunrise. Um, and we're going to get into PWCs and some of that in just a little bit. Um, diver down flags. That is probably going to be one of the, the more targeted areas um, we have seen a, a decline in trend with violations with that and it's simply because of um, educational push outs that we have done um, and the Coast Guard has done and even your local law enforcement is pushing that I know Taylor County Sheriff's Office we work extremely close with them with their marine units um, those are, are those are situations that can get someone hurt and get them hurt fast so the regulations that, that follow with the diver down flags are very important. Um, the diver down flags, a lot of people don't understand that that's just, that is not specifically related to scuba. Um, if you are going to be in the water with a snorkel, um, you are required to display a diver down flag. And the reason for that is, is 
when you have a snorkel or any breathing apparatus that prevents you from having to lift your head up to get air, you're going to be staying down longer with your head down and not paying attention to what's going on around you. Uh, the diver down flags, um, they do restrict the vessel traffic around you, but on the same note, they restrict what you're doing as a diver in the water. So th there's a burden for you as a diver when you display that flag that you must adhere to as well. Um, it applies whenever someone is wholly or partially submerged with a face mask or snorkel. Um, these, these devices are designed for used by divers and dive vessels as a way to no notify nearby boaters that divers are in the water and the following restrictions apply. Um, it must contain a diver's down symbol. That's a nationally recognized symbol for divers. Um, it is a square or white diagonal stripe um, through the red flag. Um, there's not, there's some new improvements, some new technology that has came out with those. Uh, we recognize this and you'll see some photos of it. Um, if you're going to be displaying a uh, diver's down flag from a vessel, um, it, must, it must be rectangular in shape. Um, 12 inches by 24 inches is what the requirements are minimum. The diver's down symbol depends on whether the diver's down warning device is displayed from the water or from a vessel on the water. And in the water, the flag requirements are 12 by 12, and it must have a wire stiffener that keeps it displayed at all times. Um, there are a couple of different ones. Um, the one you're seeing right there um, is a diver's down flag in the water. Um, you'll hear diver's down buoys. Um, this is just a flag that's towable. Um, and those connect to the diver themselves, and it restricts the boating traffic from around you. Um, the diver's down flags on a vessel, they must be displayed at the highest point of the vessel. So just tying them off to the console or tying them off to the, the outboard or something that you would see you know, right on your boat, you need to have those at the highest point on a pole or they make the fiberglass poles or even from fish holders, they make um, these inserts that go in your rod holders on T-tops that will display it up high enough to where everybody can see it. It must be visible from 360 degrees, just like your anchor light. This is kind of a new version. Uh, we saw one of these in live. We had a, uh, a meeting with Boating Safety and Waterways came out and kind of showed us what you know the new technology was. Um, this one is just an expandable and it's made so that the wind rotates and you can still see it. Um, the one on your left is the buoy, the one on the right will be your flag towables. Um, 300 feet is what, you, what is restricted when you display a diver's down flag um, in open waters. Uh, that restricts vessel traffic and you, you as a diver must make an, a reasonable effort to stay within that 300 feet. Um, 100 feet in restricted navigation such as inlets, rivers, and channels. Vessel registrations, um, you're required to, dis to have a vessel registration certificate, which is the one on top, when we do um, registration inspections and vessel inspections. Um, and at the bottom is, is the proper way to display it on your vessel. It must be visible on both sides, be at least three inch lettering, and have your spaces between FL and DX. Um, that is standardized, and that is the requirements for your registrations. And we're working with a little bit of condensed timing and a lot of information to push, so I'm having to move a little quick. Uh, personal watercraft, um, when you're operating a personal watercraft, those are quite popular. You must have a PFD on your body at all times. Even if you're towing skiers, they are required to have one and have the lanyard and all the same safety gear that you would with a vessel. Uh, the lanyard is a kill switch. It hooks to your vest or to your arm, and it must be connected um, to be in compliance with, PF, with the uh, PWC regulations. Um, Personal watercraft may not be operated half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise, even if navigation lights are used. Um, that's what we're, I'm sorry. We had a question from online about if divers down flags are also required on personal watercraft. Anytime you have divers in the water, a divers down flag is required. If you're using a breathing apparatus, snorkel, or any of those situations. Um, you cannot operate PWCs um, after one half hour 
after sunset to one half hour prior to sunrise. Um, there is a window between sunset um, and one half hour that you may operate, but you must have navigation lights. Um, reckless um, navig or operating PWCs, like this situation is here, operating PWCs in a careless or reckless manner is a violation. Uh, wake jumping, running behind other boats. You don't have the same control over PWCs uh, underway as you do vessels. Um, and we have a lot of inexperienced operators and liveries that, that allow rentals. Um, so the PWC regulations are extremely important. And there's also some age requirements in, in addition to your boater safety education requirements with PWCs. Um, but any operation um, where you're in danger or not taking in consideration um, property or other, other people's lives is considered reckless. Um, a person must be at least 14 years of age to operate a personal watercraft in Florida, and it is unlawful for any person in Northern to allow someone under 14 years old to operate a PWC. So if you're a parent and you have PWCs and you have all the kids there for the weekend, you make sure before they get on that PWC that they have that boater education card and they are at least 14 years of age. Because even with that card, you cannot operate a PWC unless you're 14 years of age. Boating under the influence. Um, it's a violation of Florida law to operate any vessel while you're impaired by alcohol or any other drugs. Um, we are at a very heightened sense with that uh, starting tomorrow. Um, there, is a, um, there is an operation dry water that's coming that starts June 30th through July 2nd. It, it goes on annually, but it, it is heightened awareness for those days. It's just like click it or ticket with your safety belts. So make sure if you're going to be operating a boat or going to be on a boat, that if there's going to be alcohol on that boat, that you have a designated driver. Uh, we will be targeting BUI enforcement uh, heavily now through the, all the holiday weekends um, that are coming. Operation Dry Water is what I was speaking about. Um, that's just a heightened um, awareness set of days every year annually. It goes on annually, um, but these are the high enforcement uh, times that we are out there strictly targeting um, boating under the influence violations. Base scallops is what we're here for. Regulations on base scallops. I brought saltwater recreational um, handouts, two gallons, whole base scallops in the shell per day. The best idea, if you don't want to go buy anything, just to get a five-gallon bucket, fill it up with two gallons of water, mark it with a Sharpie, and try to watch that line. Um, we know when you're out there, everybody starts picking up scallops and gets carried away and until you get them all in the boat. There is a vessel requirement. Um, uh, Ten gallons in the shell or a half a gallon per vessel or two gallons whole in the shell per person or one pint of meat per person on the boat. Um, whichever is greater. The base scallop zones for zone two, which is going to be what we're in, is from the Finn Holloway, and I'm going to skip forward to a map. What he had up earlier, the yellow zone is us starting tomorrow, June, um, June 16. Um, it basically comes straight down, and there's some navigation. There's actually some coordinates. Um, you can see it comes out to Rock Island and goes straight down to the, the federal line which is at the nine mile line. It does go all the way into Levy County, our zone, which is the June 16th through September 10th. Um, and it is, it is unlawful also, just as a note, um, you cannot harvest bay scallops in zone two and travel through another closed zone to the boat ramp. So if you're going to be launching outside of zone two to scallop, make sure you do not carry them back through a, a zone that is not open yet for harvest on base scallops. Um, and as always, if you see violations, please report those violations. And these are some ways with technology that has advanced. Um, we have apps that you can do that through. Um, we have Fish Hunt Florida, which will provide a lot of information and give you a contact resource for us when you're on the water. It also provides um, a place to store and sync your fishing license and recreational licenses. Um, you can do it by text message to tip at myfwc.com. And we will be pushing out press releases through uh, Flickr, um, through Facebook.
Facebook, through Instagram, um, at MyFWC. And there's the, the universal number at the bottom to where you can actually call and get someone on the phone and not an automated line if you need to reach out or if you need an officer. Um, and as always, if you have an emergency, 911 will get us as well if it's going to be water related. We'll be working very closely with the Sheriff's Office Fire and Rescue and Emergency Management in, in general. Um, I appreciate it. And if you have any questions before I leave, I'll hang around and feel free to ask. Well, we really appreciate them. And uh, you can see they have a lot, a big job. Uh, and I appreciate some of the rules and regulations, the things I had not heard lately. Uh, our next speaker, uh, we've been, he's helped us with this for many years, and I've come to greatly respect him for his knowledge and for what he provides for us at, uh, in the scallop season particularly. And it's a lot of work, and so we have Dr. Stephen Geiger, that's going to speak to us now, and I think he does have accounts for us. So hopefully tonight, we, uh, that's what people have been waiting for, waiting to hear. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me get the clock up. I don't know which one it is. This one, the one on the bottom. This one mm -hmm. No, we'll get to it. Sorry, my uh, laptop's configured for my desk, so. Uh, That's not it. Yeah, I can't find it. I'm sorry, it's my computer too. But, uh. <laughs> Well, I know where it is, so. There we go. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I especially want to thank um, Taylor County people uh, for having me up here every year and I really appreciate that uh, all the Sea Grant and UF people have come out. Uh, this has really grown over the last couple of years. Uh, the number of people that showed up in the crowd, this is all great. Uh, and in particular, I want to acknowledge the law enforcement officers who are here tonight. We all know from the news lately that um, I think they love their job probably, especially the guys that work on the water, but they still have a very special job that has requirements above and beyond what we all do. So. Uh, Thank you again for that service. So, um, all right, so like Ms. Bastea said, I think I've been doing this about 10 years. I've been up here six or seven times in that time. I love the area. It's a great area. And I'm going to touch on a lot of the topics that uh, Savannah talked about, um, some of the stuff the law enforcement guys talked about. Uh, my job is to be the state's molluscan fisheries expert. Uh, I'm not going to go into everything, but we have about a thousand species of snails and about 400 species of things with two shells and then some other stuff. So my primary job is scallops, which is great. They're a, a fun species, but there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, and in particular, the snails are a lot of fun. So um, hopefully everybody gets to see some scallops tomorrow. I assume everybody's going scalloping. Um, there are some shells out. I was happy to see that. There are orange scallops this year. 
Typically, it's about one in a thousand. You will see orange on both sides. But if you find them that are big enough to keep, um, they're out there this year. They're, it's just uh, some years there's more than others. It's a genetic thing. Both shells will be orange, and you'll see some, just FYI. How many people have seen my talk before? I know some of the Taylor County people, but most of the people in the crowd have not. So I'll talk a little bit about bay scallops. Bay scallops uh, are what's called a, a broadcast spawner. They are both male and female at the same time. Um, but they cast their gametes, their sperm and eggs, out into the water column. They have to be near a neighbor for those eggs to get fertilized. And so one of the problems is that when the density gets really low, uh, for example, Tampa Bay, when I first started this project, we had about one scallop per acre. Imagine a scallop that can swim a couple of meters trying to find a partner in an acre of seagrass. It's just not going to happen. Up here, um, if things are really good and you get on a good patch, one of my colleagues at FWC says a really good one is an is a eight for You can get four in each hand if you have big hands. Um, I can usually get two or three in each hand. Um, you might find some of those patches. I don't know. Um, but in, in a place like this, they have a lot better chance of finding a neighbor to reproduce for next year. Uh, scallops have, uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but they have a larvae. Their larvae is 0 0.06 millimeters. So it's pretty tiny. You cannot see the larvae with your with your eyes, you can see it through a microscope. When they settle as a, um, a spat, this is a spat here. Um, there's a little better picture. Um, that green thread, if you ever use those, like the chore boys or the, the scrubby sponges on your in your kitchen, that green thread gives you an idea. They're a little bit thicker than the green threads on your scrub pads in your kitchen when they first settle. Um, so less than a millimeter, really hard to see. If you have really good eyes, I don't anymore. You can see the little specks on the seagrass without um, a microscope. This just gives you an idea. Um, that's uh, a couple weeks old. And within about um, six or eight weeks, a base scallop will start to reach, in, in a really good condition, they can actually be dime-sized. When things are really, really good, they can be quarter-sized in about eight weeks. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, but they can. They can really fast in good conditions. You guys up here have crystal clear water. That's great for snorkeling. That means there's a little bit less food than some other places. So they actually will grow faster in a place like Tampa Bay where there's a lot of nutrients in the water, um, not very good viz. Um, they grow a little slower up here. Savannah touched on this. The two main types of grass you can see, Thalassia and Syringodium, the flat stuff that's like fettuccine and the round stuff that's like spaghetti. Um, you will also see what's called shoal grass up here. Um, and then stargrass. This year, there happens to be a lot of stargrass. Um, and don't just ignore the stargrass because there are scallops in the stargrass this year. Um, it's not true every year. And you'll see them. They're, they're these, um, it looks different when you're underwater, but it's, it's I can't remember, five or six blades. Um, looks like a little flower on the bottom. And you'll find patches this year 50 and 100 yards long. And they'll, they'll still be there. So um, don't just ignore those. The shoal grass, even though it's really soft and nice, a lot of times it doesn't have very many scallops. A lot of times that's knee deep water and um, you might find less of them, but they're pretty much everywhere this year. So my job primarily is to monitor the bay scallop fishery. And so we actually monitor on a typical basis from Pine Island all the way up to Pensacola. We're actually doing some oil spill restoration in the panhandle because they have not had a season since 2002 and we are trying to get that reopened. That has two benefits. Number one, if we can restore the population in the Panhandle and in the Southwest, um, number one, it's better for the population. The, the, the more different subpopulations you have, the better the entire population. But the other thing, which I hope, is that eventually, if we can get some of the other areas to be fishable, it might take some of the pressure off of places like Steen Hatchie and Homosassa. I don't know that for a fact. It might just make more scallopers. But um, I would assume if we have more open areas, it will be better in general for the population. So your area right here, Dixie Taylor, is in the heart of the Bay Scout population. It is the most stable population that we look at. We do two primary tasks. Number one, every year starting the last week of May or so, uh, running, it'll take us this year into July, we survey the population. The intent of that is to get an estimate of the long-term trend uh, prior to the harvest season. So we're looking at our record. We started in 2002, or 1992, sorry. Um, so that's about a 25-year data record where we can look at, well, it would be nice to look at trends. And I'll show you a graph. It's hard to interpret trends in scallops. 
The other thing we look at are recruit traps. I did not bring a trap with me this year, but essentially what we do is we take a cinder block, a crab pot buoy, and a rope, and we tie a citrus bag to it, and we stuff it full of plastic. What the larval scallops like is they like a nice, clean substrate to settle on. And there are baby scallops in the water all year round in Florida. Um, most of them happen in the fall, but they spawn all year. We were just in Lenark last week. Great big scallops that had bright orange gonads. Um, they may not be there in a couple weeks when they start their season. I, you know, I don't know that, but um, this is this is a, a pretty typical trap on a good day. We might get 70 or 80 as an average. Our record is over 4,000 spat in a single half bushel spat trap for an eight-week period. Uh, we just started here in Steen Hatchie, so I can't really talk about your Dixie tail or recruitment yet, um, but you do get recruits most of the year here. So there's some animals either spawning or larvae coming from somewhere else. That's just a picture of what it looks like. It's just literally a citrus bag or an onion bag stuffed with plastic. Um, when we do our surveys, we do a 300 meter transect. We do a triangle simply so that we can get back to the boat and the adds a little bit of strength to the data when we have, uh, it's not really true replicates, but we get an estimate of how variable each station is. We do 20 of these triangles in each of our 10 sites around the state, and then we have a little bit of a different study up in the Panhandle now. Um, 300 meters is a long ways to swim. It takes two divers. Um, typically, when there's a lot of grass, about an hour to do this. We check the entire seagrass from the tips down to the bed. Even in three or four feet of water, sometimes we will dive if the grass is really thick because we have to be able to stay on the bottom with the transect um, and count them all. So sometimes you'll see my numbers. We will find little bitty guys that most of you probably will not find snorkeling. You'll find a, some occasionally. Um, I won't go into all this, but essentially by doing this program, we have come up with criteria for what we consider a stable population, a transitional, and a collapsed population. Um, healthy transitional collapsed. Our criteria, six scallops in our 600 square meter survey, seems to match the amount of scallops that we need to produce a healthy crop for next year. So when your population falls below that, we see less recruits for the next year, and it, um, it could feed into itself. Um, and we do not want any of our populations to collapse like what happened in Citrus County um, in the 90s. So that's our goal. Um, distribution. Ideally, we want to see scallops at every station. Most of our sites around the state do not have that. Um, and then we want to see it bounce back. Steen Hatchie typically, you'll see in the data, has uh, a peak about every four to seven years. Um, and that's good resilience. One of the things, obviously, that we worry about, there's nothing we can do about it, but um, scallops have a lot of natural predators. When they're little and they're mobile, if they don't stay attached to the seagrass, virtually everything will, will eat them. They look like a little jig flittering around in the ocean, if you've ever seen a little one swim. Lizard fish, sea bass, any of the mobile predators will, will eat the little guys. Um, once they get bigger, uh, cow nose rays, sting rays, any of those kind of things, um, stone crabs, blue crabs, and even some of the snails uh, will prey on uh, scallops. They're just, they're, they're essentially chumming food for all the other stuff that the recreational fishermen, um, and even the commercial fishermen. Um, octopus, when you have a year where you have a lot of octopus in the crab traps, I have to assume they're taking a lot of scallops too. So um, lots of natural predators for scallops. I know, Savannah, you touched on this. One of the best seagrass beds, not just in the state, but really anywhere in the world. 300,000 acres, contiguous, uh, Levy, Citrus, Hernando combined. Depending on whose statistics you read, uh, about 480,000 more acres of seagrass. So combined, and then if you extend that down into Pasco Pinellas, about a million acres of seagrass forms the core of the base scout population. That's a tremendous amount of habitat. Um, when you think about the fact there's 4,000 acres in each square kilometer, um, it's a lot of square meters, and we can't possibly count it all. Our original survey design, I don't know if anybody recognizes the nav charts locally. Um, our original survey design was based on the old NOAA charts before we had things like GPS. Um, well, we had really bad handheld GPS, but we took the old NOAA charts, went from the two to six foot line on the old charts and randomized uh, a grid literally using a piece of graph paper to try to um, distribute our survey across the survey region. I know that there are scallops deeper, and I know that there are some scallops shallower in these places. That was just how our design was done because we only have so much effort. We have three people to cover the whole state for the month of June. So, uh, and I, now I have some grant people that help. So, what does all the data tell us? Um, 
How many, I know it's not that great. How many people can read the graph, can see this? You probably cannot read the legends. The red line represents the distribution. The blue line represents the population. So the numbers that I have reported for many years, and we're, we're trying to switch it over to per square meter, but is the number of scallops that we see on our survey transects. It's a 300 meter line, 600 square meters. And so the best year ever back in 1996 was about 250 scallops, essentially um, one scallop every two meters. So imagine taking a step, another step, there's another scallop. Now they don't, of course, occur like that. You'll find 10 in a clump and then you'll swim a little ways. But what that works out to is um, about a half a scallop per square meter. Last year, I have to say, was an exceptionally good year in steam hatchy. Um, and you can see, trying to pick a trend out of my data over the years of how many scallops, um, you can't really. It's, it's an annual crop. It comes and goes. The thing to note is that every time steam hatchy has a down couple of years, it comes back within a couple of years. And so that's a good thing. Um, and I'll talk about this number. It, it's not as bad as it looks. 60.7, um, or 61.7, sorry. Um, is right above our criteria for a good year. Um, the other thing, though, that I want to point out is that red line. The red line in this graph represents the distribution, so the percentage of stations that we went out and surveyed that had scallops. Now, most of the areas in the state, somewhere between, well, a lot of zeros, actually. There are places that we go where you just aren't finding scallops right now. Um, but steam hatching, since we started doing this, is typically around 90 95%. And if you look at the last, since 06, almost every year, every site or every station that we look at at this site will have scallops. Even some of the areas both south and north of the year where the grass has kind of died back for a variety of reasons, urchins, and then 12, you had a really weird rain year. Even in the sandy patches, we are finding scallops. So this population up here, um, even though they require the seagrass, they don't require, but they prefer the seagrass to settle. We consider it a requirement. Some of those scallops will move out into the sand and they still persist. So the good news is they're everywhere, maybe not in as great a numbers um, as you would like to see. So um, these are not the actual GPS points. They're, you know, those triangles are something like five miles on a side. Um, they're pretty big. Um, I do that on purpose. If you go from station to station, this is the long-term average. The long-term average for steam hatchy is that in most years, at any given station, you have that 60 criteria. So steam hatchy, by and large, on average, is one of the best places we have in the state. Um, and you can see, on average, the stuff around the, the river has a little bit less. That's sort of an average year. 2015 was not such a great year. Um, I think it was still suffering from this 2012. We just had a weird year and the grass died back. There was a lot of stuff that went on. So it wasn't, wasn't maybe the best year, but there were still patches out there. If you knew where to look, um, pick up your boat and move. Last year, I mean, pretty much everywhere you go. So if you look at one of our triangles, you know, we, we have a target point. We go some distance away. Typically up here, I can't go to my station. It seems like there's always a fisherman. But pretty much wherever you go, if, if you didn't find them there, you move a quarter mile, half mile away, and there was another patch. So um, don't get too caught up on where they are on any particular. Same for this year, 2017. Lots of decent patches, lots of OK patches, a couple of places where there just wasn't that many, but there were scallops everywhere. So my advice would be they're around. Um, pick up and move if you don't find them. So hope, hopefully um, you find a bunch of scallops and you get to dissect them. Um, scientific words for shucking. Um, this is what the gonad looks like. If they are ripe, you will see a, a, a sort of a kidney bean shaped thing, white with orange on it. Um, and of course, you're trying to get the adductor muscle. The gonads are digestible. They're, the whole thing is, is edible. We haven't had a red tide up here. Most people don't. I've heard that if you grill the whole thing, um, some people like it, some don't. I don't know. Um, your choice. <laughs> Um, this is a pretty nice scallop, which is shuck. That's what you're looking for. Obviously, it would be nice if everybody came home with scallop meats that was the size of their thumb. Um, that may or may not happen. I tried to do this to scale. I didn't get it perfect. But what you're going to see when you are this year is a bunch of scallops that are two, two and a quarter inches. They're going to have decent meats in them. And then you're going to see a bunch of scallops that are about an inch and a quarter. If you bring back to your bucket a scallop, which is an inch and a quarter, uh, it's going to be about half of your tip of your pinky. If you wait until August, that scallop will be a nice thumb-sized meat. Um, 
The numbers I put up here are approximate three inch scallops, something like 100 scallops, three to your limit. Um, two inch scallops, somewhere between 150 and 300, depending on the size of the meat. The meat just hasn't even grown yet. Um, and so my suggestion is if you're out there, especially because we're two weeks early this year, leave the little bitty guys. They will be nice for someone else to come harvest in August. Um, focus on the bigger ones. It's just, um, you may not even find the little ones, but um, it's just a suggestion. Let them grow up a little. Scalloping has changed a lot in, in some years. This is a picture by Karen Parker, who worked with our law enforcement agency back in 2005. This is, I'm, my apologies, the best pictures I have are from Citrus, but Steenhatchy has a similar fleet. Um, this was the fleet in 2005 when Citrus reopened. It was about 50 boats. It took it years to really to get going. I mean, it reopened in 2002, there was a few people. Um, the, the fleet had grown quite a bit, and you can't hardly see this, but the fleet started to spread out, started to get massive. Um, 2015, Citrus County, um, it, was, it was mayhem. If you are boating, and I'm sure uh, Lieutenant Guy would agree, it is almost impossible to even move at idle speed safely through that kind of fleet. It just gets, you have to have eyes on the bow watching when you're moving. Um, I did it with a, a coworker and four reporters on the boat, and we could, you know, I, we were very all very uncomfortable. It just the fleet gets really, really insane rate lately. So um, we, we are, we're starting to do it from a plane. You cannot see it at all from here, but um, you can't capture it with a camera anymore. It's just it's too big to get with a good lens, and if you do it wide, you can't see the boat. So um, again, it's uh, not the greatest, but if you could see this picture, that white line. Um, if you watch the River Channel tomorrow morning, there is a boat launching as fast as they can. I mean, there's it, just as fast as you can launch. I think people are going down that channel. So be, please be very wary of the other boaters crossing the wakes. Um, if a thunderstorm comes, which two or three years ago it did, you'll have that line going out. And then it, it looks like one of those uh, games, those online games where you have 400 boats trying to come backwards down the channel. Um, and by the time they get in and th those guys go out, the storm is past you. So sometimes it may be safer to just uh, hunker down somewhere. Um, I, I know Catherine talked a little bit about con conservation. One of the things that I'm trying to do, and, and I'm really appreciative that UF is, is, and the extension agents are trying to work with us, we're trying to get estimates. My estimate for Citrus County is somewhere between uh, 100,000 and 400,000 trips last year of people going out and harvesting scallops. Steen a smaller, but it's, it's the same trend. There's a certain amount of scallops, and you can see from that graph I showed you, it's, it's essentially level, but it's hard to figure out if there's really a slope. But one thing I know for sure is that the number of boaters is going up. Um, at some point, those two lines are going to cross. Um, the other thing that's happening is there are more and more charter boats, more and more rental boats. Um, and so essentially the message is that the effort is increasing, but the resource is not. And again, that's why I really strongly urge you don't take the little ones, especially don't take the little ones, get back to the dock and decide they're too small to shuck. If you, if you decide you have little ones, leave them in a cooler, take them back out the next day and put them in the sea grass. If, we, if you realize how hard it is to shuck the little guys, um, they will not live here in the river if you throw them back, but they might live if you take them back out tomorrow. Um, Regulations change all the time for scallops. I'm going to quiz you on, on all that in a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. Um, since the oil spill, we've been trying to find the right, uh, the right balance for the seasons. And um, our commission is very receptive to listening to the public. And I encourage you, if you have concerns, take it to the commission. Um, they will certainly consider every comment. The important thing, Lieutenant Guy already covered, um, two gallons per person or one pint, 10 gallons maximum per boat. If you have 20 people on your boat, your limit is still 10 gallons of whole scallops. It doesn't go up because you have extra people. And importantly here for your county, June 16th, which is tomorrow through September 10th. And of course, everybody that's in this room is probably going to be within the legal harvest zone tomorrow. Don't harvest here and go retrieve your boat in St. Mark's. Uh, a pint of scallops is about a half of a quart Ziploc bag. I thought I'd put that reminder up there. If you have a gallon bag per person filled with meat, you have exceeded your limit. Um, and this is a 10-gallon cooler with probably about 10 gallons of scallops in it. If it's heaping over and falling on the deck, same for the five-gallon pail, 
um, you may be over your actual limit. So uh, what are you going to expect? Um, I can't think of a better way to say it. Please, please just be patient tomorrow if you're launching your boat um, and you're motoring. Be very patient if you're trying to retrieve your boat during a thunderstorm because everybody gets uh, a little bit, uh, their emotions get elevated, I think is the best way to do it, um, even if you're sober, which is a recommendation. Um, the sandbars, be very careful coming and going and um, watch your prop scars around those sandbars. Um, anybody remember Simone Manuel? I had to throw this one up here. I used to have Michael Phelps, but I thought I'd change my slide. She was the first uh, African-American woman to win a gold in the Olympics. Um, she's a great swimmer. I'm an okay swimmer. Um, if you start your swim downstream with the current and you think you can swim back to the boat, you may be mistaken. When you are scalloping, figure out which way the current is, try to swim into the current. Um, that way, if you get tired, you can drift back to your boat. It's just a suggestion, which I, I like. Um, there is supposed to be one responsible person who is the captain. If you leave a person on the boat, I strongly recommend that that person know how to A, start the motor, and B, pull the anchor. If they don't, it's very hard to retrieve the tired swimmer. The other thing which was pointed out to me, though, in a talk, um, if you decide you have to go help a swimmer, you need to account for all your swimmers. You can't just go rescue that one person who's struggling and then the rest of your snorkelers are in the water. So the person who's on the boat really has a kind of a responsibility to keep track of everybody um, in the fleet. Fortunately here, there's probably another boat somewhere close. Certainly in Citrus there will be. So um, we touch on this. Make sure especially your kids have the appropriate size jacket. Um, those little flags, which we use for working, um, the little flags that are in the water are tough to see. So preferably wear your polarized glasses. Um, and respect the flag, especially try to keep your flag up above your T-top. Watch your tide. There are some low places here that have some really beautiful sandbars. Um, low tide tomorrow, I think, is around 1 in the afternoon. Um, so if you start in a really shallow place and you get distracted, uh, you may be here till about dinner time. Just a, a word of warning. This is also a picture from uh, Joe Johnston. He used to fly helicopters. I'm not sure he's still with the force. Um, but it's a, it's a picture from our law enforcement, and you can't see that that's seagrass, but those are seagrass scars. There are some places that are worse than others. Um, I don't honestly know what county that's from. It's just illustrating. Uh, please be cognizant of the fact that the seagrass is a, a habitat that you can't harm. Uh, we had a little bit of this today, or I had it on the way up. Um, getting struck by lightning is not worth scallops. It's just not. Um, make it a fun day, and we all have... Most of us have phones now. You can see the weather coming. So um, know when it's time to go home and try to be safe out there. There are people who will shuck your scallops for you. I would strongly encourage you to make note of the hygiene of the people that are shucking your scallops for you. Uh, it's a really growing industry. Uh, I'm not sure how regulated it is, but uh, it's just a suggestion. Uh, the other thing that I want to encourage, um, and I've been telling as many people as I can, there's a lot of other stuff out there. This is a great family activity, and a lot of times, especially the kids, they'll get tired of collecting scallops pretty quick. Um, there's a lot of other critters out there to either look at or take pictures of or whatever. There's a lot of great shelling, especially in the sandy areas. So um, make it a fun activity and uh, be willing to you know, expand just beyond scalloping. You can come here in a not scallop season and have a blast. It's a beautiful area. So I'll I'll stop there. I think we're Does it depend on how to cook the if you've got small stalls and you
really high tide or something. I, I doubt the salinity is okay here. So, do we want to do questions or do we want to? We have one more talk, right? Just one question. Yeah. How long does the scallop live? The scallops in Florida live about a year, somewhere between seven months and two and a half, but mostly they live around a year. I'm going to leave it there. I think the plan was to have all of our talks first, and then we'll all be around for questions after. So um, <coughs> that's what I have for now. And uh, <laughs> thank I know. I was trying to find his. Uh, I'll let Victor. Uh, yeah. I'll let Victor line up. Yeah, yeah. We we do have something new this year. Uh, Dr. Remain Parthy. Did I Raymond Parthy? U University of Florida Unmanned Aircraft System Research Program. We're getting into uh, a lot of uh, technical stuff, even out here. It will help them. And he's going to give us a talk on what they can, it, it's going to have help with our scallop situation so we can have da more data. Thank Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I realize it's getting late. Some of us haven't had dinner yet, so I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. Uh, my name is Ray Carthy. I'm with the University of Florida, also with USGS, Uni uh, US Geological Survey, and the Florida Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at the university. And uh, I'm going to tell you uh, briefly about our research program and then even more briefly about what we're doing here this year to try to help out with the monitoring situation. So uh, the University of Florida Unmanned Aircraft Research Program has been in existence for about mm, just over 18 years now. Um, from our very beginnings, uh, we were natural resource based. Uh, you may not know this, but one of the primary causes of mortality for wildlife biologists is aircraft surveys flying low and slow in order to view habitat and to count animals. And so we started thinking years ago with the advent of drones. We don't call them drones because people think of drones as bombing or spying. Or, uh, so we try to use UAS, unmanned aircraft systems, or unmanned aerial vehicles. And uh, yes, yeah, so we thought that we could use this technology to help wildlife surveys and to get a better idea to get more accurate information for counting wildlife, for looking at habitat, et cetera. Uh, so uh, we approached it from the natural resource point of view, which is simplicity and low budget. And it's a truly interdisciplinary program at UF. Um, we have a wildlife component. We have the, we come up with the ideas and the questions. Primarily we have a uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering component. They build our craft, they integrate sensors, cameras, whatever, and uh, we have a geomatics component. And they take the data, the imagery that we collect, the data that comes from the cameras, whether it's video, whether it's video or still cameras, and they put that all together into something we can look at and use. And one thing that we've always done with our program is we've operated within full FAA compliance. So, uh, this may be difficult to see the years, but we started in the upper, uh, I guess it's on your left-hand corner, with the pole bat many years ago. That was an off-the-shelf product after the last one flew into Tampa Bay, uh, and we never got it back. We realized that uh, it wasn't something that we could really use and work with. So that's when we contacted the aerospace people at UF, and we started building our own in-house, our own uh, fixed wing craft, and you'll see kind of an evolution there, uh, all the way to our current fixed wing craft, which we call Nova 2.1. It's got about a nine-foot wingspan, uh, 
weighs about 14 pounds, fully loaded. It can, it's hand launched and it can land on water and it has a runtime of about an hour. And uh, it can carry multiple sensors, um, still cameras, video cameras, uh, infrared, and we're working on integrating LIDAR, which is laser imaging on that platform now. Uh, <clears throat> because there are places in Florida and everywhere that you can't fly UAS, whether it be regulations or proximity to aircraft, to manned aircraft, to airports and such, and also um, my FWC friends know that according to the Florida drone law, that FWC is not allowed to use drones for any purpose. Any uh, agency with a law enforcement division in Florida is not allowed to use uh, UAS uh, because of privacy and other concerns. Um, so we decided to um, approach this problem by integrating the sensors, the cameras and such we put together into what we call the external sensor package or box on a strut that we can put on a manned aircraft and get the same sort of high quality, high resolution imagery that we get on our, uh, air, on our drones um, from a manned aircraft. So that's our second uh, sort of platform that we use. That's another picture of our external sensor package. And uh, within the last two, two and a half years, we've developed a, a rotorcraft package, an octocopter. Uh, we took an off-the-shelf, uh, high-end octocopter and uh, did a lot of uh, things to it. We uh, uh, 3D printed some components we integrated a whole bunch of different camera systems into it to meet our natural resource needs. And so that's the copter system we have now. Uh, one reason for having these different platforms is because you have courses for courses. Not every, not one platform won't answer all the questions you have. Um, we think of the octocopter as a tool to use when we have to cover acres, the uh, fixed wing, covers uh, kilometers, and the box on a strut external sensor package covers miles. So you have uh, different levels of resolution and different tools to use. And we like to keep a full toolbox uh, for the different questions to come up in natural resources. So when you, when you have these uh, sensor packages and aircraft collecting information, uh, what do you do with it? Either video or still imagery has to be processed. If you're taking still imagery, it has to be turned into a mosaic that you can look at and uh, count items or identify habitat. Uh, this is an example of the kind of resolution we can get. I believe this was at Loxahatchee Refuge, uh, maybe at flying at 160 meters. I know it's difficult to see because of lighting in the room, but from that large image zooming in, we were able to tell that that gator, we were able to tell the size of that alligator within about three or four centimeters because of the pixel resolution we have. Uh, these are some images that we've taken, Seahorse Peak. Uh, what you see on your left there is the Google Earth image resolution versus the kind of resolution that we can get. Um, we usually get about each pixel on the image is 2.5 centimeters or less resolution on the ground. Uh, we mosaic, this is another example of a blow up um, of a mosaic image. You can actually count the number of uh, nesting birds there within that image. And we see all sorts of things in the Big Bend. Um, these are some of the things you might observe from uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, Shark in the upper corner, uh, bottlenose dolphins, a sea turtle, um, roosting pelicans in the lower right hand corner, and uh, that's very difficult to see manatees in the upper corner. We've used them for all, we've used our um, systems for all kinds of different applications. Uh, you can see some of these here. I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time. Uh, most recently, we've used our uh, rotorcraft up at Tall Timbers Research Station up north of Tallahassee to uh, do a fire study 
with the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, the USGS also, looking at uh, control burns and the kind of particulate matter that comes off of them, the fuel load on the ground, and how hot and fast they burn. And we actually flew into the smoke plume and took a bunch of measurements successfully. So uh, what we hope to do this season, uh, Victor approached us about uh, helping with the monitoring of the scallop fleet for the season. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Geiger has been doing some flights for the last few years and um, counting, and we wanted to bring our expertise and our platforms to bear on these same questions to see how we can assist in getting more data to manage the fleet and manage the resource. So what we'll be doing um, immediately, this is still in the planning process, uh, you see the two red arrows. We are planning a sort of proof of concept, a manned flight with a specific uh, sensor video package uh, up and down the coast at uh, discrete times during the scalloping season. And we plan those times at the same time that uh, Dr. Geiger is doing his research. And also simultaneously, Victor has told me about some points that are monitored that they are the bird rack points. I believe um, we'll be flying the unmanned systems, the uh, octocopters at, that, at those sites all on the same day at the same time so we can compare these different methodologies to see which gives us the most accurate information about the fleet. And of course, as the previous speakers have said, this is important in terms of fleet management um, and in terms of getting the most accurate information to know what economic um, impacts the fishery has on the local community. So I think that's about all I'm going to say, um, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, according to the program, we are a little bit late, but I think it's worth it to listen to the speakers. Uh, we're going to open uh, questions and answers. If anybody wants to do questions, just to. Yeah, the question is if uh, in a boat, there are three people in a boat and they go out, they get their coat, they come uh, to the ramp and somebody else get that boat and go out, uh, it, it's going to be a problem with that? Any other questions? Ms. Sophia? Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we did record this, and you can see the slides much better on the recording because they actually had the slides on the computer. So if there was anything that you wanted to go back and look at again, we'll be posting that link on our Facebook. Um, and, you know, just thanks again so much for being here. And please fill out your pledges and your evaluations before you leave tonight and drop those off either in the back or on your way out. Um, that's important data for us. Thanks. <laughs>